Glory to God. The Lord stays on forever. <laughs> Thank the Lord. <laughs> now, we're in the fifth scene, the fifth scene of the Song of Solomon, which begins with the fourth verse of chapter 6 and will carry us through to the fourth verse of chapter 8, which will be the longest scene in the entire book. It carries us from one chapter through an entire chapter into the next, from 6 through 7 into 8. It's the longest scene in the book. And in this scene, it's mostly conversation. This is a conversational scene. And uh, it starts out, of course, from verses 4 to 9 in chapter 6. The bridegroom, he's reiterating, he's restating the loveliness of the bride after their separation, after there's been this separation because of her not working for the Lord, her inactivity. Then after that, when the, there's communion restored, he restates some of the very things, in fact, the very things that he had restated, that he had stated in chapter 4 previous to their separation. And then <clears throat> down on in there, verses 10 through 13, we have a conversation going on. We have the bride speaking and Solomon speaking and the daughters of Jerusalem all are speaking there concerning the bride and what you see when you see the bride. And we have concluded with, in the last part of verse 13 that when you see the Shulamite, the Gentile bride, you see, as it were, the company of two armies, Mahanaim. Well, well, that's where we have concluded our study last week, and we continue now. Just disregard the fact that we're going into chapter 7. This, it just continues in the same scene. And here, now the daughters of Jerusalem express themselves about the bride's beauty. Now, the bridegroom expressed himself, and now the daughters of Jerusalem, which of course typify the church outside the bride, are, are telling how lovely the bride is now. And uh, they make this statement, and of course the daughters of Jerusalem also typify the Jewish people who turn down the Lord. But now the Jewish people themselves are beginning to see many of them the beauty of the bride. And that's the reason we have now the Shekinah movement among the Jewish youth these days. How beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. Now we have a complete line right here. We have one solid bank of metaphors here, speaking. And uh, I'm, I, it would take forever, <laughs> figuratively, to go through all of them with the length of time that I'd like to. But I am going to have to scan each one of these to get the picture. First of all, how beautiful are thy feet with shoes, O prince's daughter. Now, the word shoes here actually is sandals in the Hebrew. How beautiful are thy feet with sandals or their footwear, O prince's daughters. Now, of course, right away, we can understand the, the uh, signification here because Feet in the gospel, or in the Bible, I should say, in the scriptures, always signify the spreading of the gospel. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of those who carry good tidings. And uh, there's many, many places. And of course, in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians chapter 6, when it gives us the whole armor of God, it includes this. And uh, this is Ephesians 6 and verse 15. And your feet shod with a preparation of the gospel of peace. And the word preparation simply, simply means with the readiness of the gospel of peace. That means wherever you walk, you are ready instantly to give every man an answer to the hope that's in you. You are a spreader of the good news. That's what gospel means. And feet, and when it said, How beautiful are thy feet with sandals, O prince's daughter, Right away, they have recognized the fact that the bride is a spreader of the good news, <laughs> which is true. The bride is a spreader of the good news. And I have always had a feeling that people who did not witness must not be part of the bride. I've always kind of had that feeling because the Bible has a great deal to say about witnessing and telling and testifying and telling people about our experience 
And the bride was known for that. That was, a, In fact, that was the very first thing she, they saw, that she was a spreader of good news, the gospel. Wherever she went, she spread this news. And they addressed her as a prince's daughter. Well, of course, that's alluding right immediately to Psalm 45 and verses 13 and 14. I'll just read it to you, Psalm 45, 13 and 14. The king's daughter is all glorious within. Her clothing is of wrought gold. She shall be brought unto the king in raiment of needlework. The virgins, her companions who follow her, shall be brought unto thee. And, of course, in the original Hebrew, it's this fine needlework. And I think it was Sister Flowers that had an article on that one time, on fine needlework. Huh? Marie Brown. Oh, Marie Brown, that's right. It was Marie Brown. And it was an evangel, I believe. And there's been quite a bit written about that Psalm 45. And uh, this, course, fine needlework refers to the fact that there was a lot of sanctifying, there was a lot of of God's move in her life, getting her ready to be in the bride. Of course, you understand what that signification is. That to be in the bride, there's going, you're going to have a finer needlework in your life than, shall we say, the average Christian, or the Christian who's not an overcoming Christian. And it speaks of the fine needlework. And so they addressed her as the prince's daughter. Then. And she has the feet of spreading the gospel. Then she said, The joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. Now, this is simply referring to the fact of how beautifully, you know, we say a watch has jewels in it. It works better. It's supposed to, it's supposed to make the works work better. And he's given this thing that the joints of thy thighs are like jewels. He's speaking of the very thing, was it Paul that spoke of in the New Testament, where he spoke of every part fitly joined together in the body of Christ, and how they work together to edify the complete body. I wish I knew right away just which, where that is in the Word of God. Somebody knows exactly where that is. But you know the scripture I'm referring to, which every part fitly joined together. Uh, New Testament. What's that? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, Paul said. Paul's writings. That's about as far as I know right now. I, if I was trying to think, I could probably think of where it is. And uh, Ephesians, maybe. It's Ephesians or 1 Corinthians? I think Corinthians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's that? Well, anyhow, you know what I'm... Yeah, I, Ephesians 4, 16. Well, that's what I thought about being Ephesians. Now, here it is. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making increase of the body under the edifying of itself in love. Now, that's exactly the very thing that he was saying in Psalms of The joints of thy thighs, he even uses the same expression, the joints of thy thighs are like jewels, the work of the hands of a skillful workman. So it means that the bride, those who are in this body, work together beautifully. Work together beautifully. So if you see someone who's a little out of uh, sorts, not working together beautifully, well, the bride <laughs> is Everything meshes. Everything works together like a finely jeweled watch. <laughs> Amen. And uh, that lead, that causes no friction. There's no friction. And there's, uh, you know, and then the oil of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and we have a beautifully working body. Now, that's what he has in mind here. So in this one verse, first of all, she's a spreader of the good news. Secondly, she's a body that every member works together in perfect unity with every other member. Now that's the way the, the church is seeing her, those outside the bread. All right, it goes ahead to say now, and he makes a statement here, thy navel is like a round goblet which wanteth not liquor. Now the word navel here is not a part of the anatomy, and I don't know why they translate it like that in the King James, because in the 
original Hebrew, it's referring to the girdle, that oriental girdle that they wear around their waist. And actually, it should say thy girdle. Uh, understand, uh, like a belt, like a sash. It'd be more like we do. The, the women these days, I don't see anybody here got one on. The closest thing you've got to it is a belt. Well, it's like a cummerbund. Yeah, it's not like a cummerbund on the outside, you know. And they uh, have a big clasp. I, of course, I was, I was used to seeing them in the Orient and have a big clasp, and I've seen them American women. And uh, right away then, we have the uh, Ephesians 6 and 14, going back to the uh, full armor. You have the very same description given of the full armor. Ephesians 6 and 14. And having, stand therefore, having your loins girded about with truth. So there's the very same thing in the New Testament in the armor that she's talking about here. Your loins girded about with truth is the same thing where it says back here that your uh, uh, sash or your girdle, they call them girdles, body girdle, and, and, and the clasp that, that fastens it. That goes around the waist. And so it's signifying then that she is surrounded. She has the truth. She walks in the truth. She's surrounded by the truth. And uh, that wanteth not liquor. And of course, or is speaking of wine. And uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, is the new wine. In other words, she, this, this, this girl, and the signification is here, that she lives and understands the Word because it's made real, the herb of the Spirit. She has the, the revelation of the Word by the Spirit, and she lives the Word. Now, it'd be awfully hard to gather that if you didn't know these the metaphorical writings here. And then he continues in this second one, Thy belly is like a heap of wheat set about with lilies. And the word here is literally waste, or your waste set about with wheat, and of course the wheat is the sown word. It's the word that as it's put out. And uh, set about with lilies, and, and we understand by lilies is the, pur the purification of the bride, the white, the lilies, and it spoke of her as being a lily of the valley, which of course means purification through sacrificial living. Now, it's very simple. You see, this whole verse then has to do with her and the Word of God. Now, up in the, when it talked about her feet, it talked about her sowing the Word of God, taking it out and, and giving forth the good news. But now in verse 2, it's referring to the effect of the Word of God in her own life, to the personal effect of the Word of God, that she is, she is uh, like a girl. She wears the Word of God, made real by the Spirit. And, and that this word, the very word that in her life, the very working of the word in her life, is an epistle. In other words, this second part of this verse is exactly what Paul had in mind when he said that we are an epistle known and read of all men. In other words, the difference is this. In, in chapter, in verse 1, where it spoke of the feet, it's, it's going out and spreading the word by mouth, by conversation, giving forth the good news. In chapter, in verse 2 here, it's the fact that she so lives in the word that the word working in her life is itself a testimony. That the word working in her life makes her life an epistle. So you see, there was one is the giving forth by mouth, the other is the living it until it becomes a testimony. The other folks, glory to God. And uh, in other words, the bride is somebody who lives in and carries the Word of God, constantly carries the Word of God. Now, you'll notice, as I'm going through here, that practically all of these, in fact, all of these, are carried out through other parts of the Word of God. Now, it goes ahead in verse 3, Thy two breasts are like two young rows that are twins. Now, we've dealt with this before. The word here is not only breast, but breastplate. And we also saw the New Testament equivalent in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. And we've already run into that in the Song of Solomon, but let's check it again. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 8. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. So that's the two parts of the breastplate as he speaks here, the two breasts. 
or as I said, the word may also breastplate. So she has faith and love. Now you see she's drawing a beautiful picture here, drawing a beautiful picture. And uh, as you go down through it, here she is spreading the gospel. She and all the other members of the body just work together in perfect unity and harmony. She is so, she so lives the word until the word in her life itself becomes a testimony to people. Her life becomes an epistle, Lord read of all men. And then she is, uh, she has faith and love as breastplates, taking on the breastplates of faith and love. Glory to God. And uh, I think that the Bible speaks of those two things as being the two principal outgrowths of the Word of God in our lives. If we literally are living the Word of God, the two principal outgrowths would be love, which of course is a chief gift, and faith. And they then, of course, are the two breastplates. All right. Now he continues in verse 4 and speaks of the neck. And the neck always in Scripture speaks of the strength of dignity, personal strength, personal strength. And, of course, the strength of the bride is her righteousness. And uh, it, it's the dignity here. It's the dignity and the strength of righteous living. Thy neck is like a tower of ivory. And we have here, in other words, we have here the dignity of being Christian men and women. The dignity of a righteous life. There is a, there is a strength there. And, and each one of these, you see, each, uh, group of these things, if you'll notice here, <coughs> these verses, you, you have a series of things that are connected with semicolons, and then you get, or, or commas, and then you get to the period. And each one of these groups fit together, like they had the group there which had to do with the Word of God being spread, and then the group that had to do with the Word of God being lived. Now here in verse 4, you've got the uh, Thy neck is like a tower of ivory, then you've got a semicolon, so you've got a related thing. Then thine eyes, like the fish pools in Heshbon. And this is a deep, quiet, inner stillness. This means that you have an inner peace. Did you know the first place that nervousness and tension and inner strife is reflected is in your eyes? You can look deeply into a person's eyes, and if they have an inner conflict, it will show in their eyes. And some of you who have been to doctors, have you, did you ever notice that uh, uh, one of the first things they'll do, they look right into your eyes, even take an eye instrument and do it. <laughs> because the eye is the gate to the soul, as they say. And if there's an inner conflict, did you know that you may be torn up on the inside, and you may just, and you may try to cover it by being real jokey or being real frivolous, you know, and, and laughing and carrying on other people. But if you look right in that person's eyes, no matter how much fun they're trying to have and how much laughing they're doing, if you look into their eyes, you'll find the reflection of the inner conflict. And they can't hide it. In their eyes. But her eyes have a serenity. The fish pools in Heshbon. Uh, was an actual place, and there was they were quiet, still pools. And what does he say? He leadeth me beside the still waters, or the waters of quietness. My friend, that is a thing that everybody needs to attain. And uh, this this inner quietness. There's a lot of things we can't help, a lot of things we can't do. But we'll have to obtain the inner quietness. And he said, by, he goes in and says, I like, like fish pools and heshbon by the gate of Bath Rabin. Now, you almost hear a word. We have in modern English a word rabble, which is comes from a derivative here, Bath Rabin, or the rabble. And that word literally means a, a multitude, a hurry and a bustle, a jostling multitude. And so what he's saying here, there, right by the gate of Bath Rabin, and I am in Hebrew, is like S in English, it makes it a plural. Right by the gate where there's a rush and a hustle and a bustle of people coming in and out and jostling one another and hawkers selling their wares and people stepping on each other's toes and jamming each other in the river with their elbows, right over to the side is pools of water, just as quiet and still as they can be. Now, she said, the eyes of the bride 
right in a hurry and bustle and jostle reflect the stillness of inner peace. You know, one of the most beautiful sermons I've ever heard, I don't know if it was original with him or if he had help in it from some other sort, but Gary Smith, who's our decap, mm -hmm. several years ago, one night, you, were you there? Mm -hmm. It was over here in Evangel Temple in Hostepco Heights, and he was speaking to a sexual meeting. And he, he used this verse, my eyes like a fish cruise and fish pond. And he did it full justice to He preached a marvelous message. And I have never forgotten. The bride has an inner peace in all the hustle and bustle. Glory to God. And so you see, these are linked. Thy neck first, you have a dignity. You have a curious dignity of righteous spiritual strength. And then you have an inner stillness. And then he goes ahead to say, Thy nose is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looketh toward Damascus. And the word nose here is also the same word as face in Hebrew. It's the same word. And, and actually, the meaning would be your face. Your face is like the Tower of Lebanon. And here it is a tremendous thing, which looks toward Damascus. Now, to my, Damascus is the enemy. Damascus is a type of the outside of the world and the enemies of the world and the things that would fight against us because Damascus is the age-old enemy of Israel, just like the flesh in the world is the age-old enemy of the church. And here is a, uh, your face then is like the tower that keeps its eyes on Damascus so it can't be raided. <laughs> keeps your eyes on the enemy and so you'll know what he's doing. That he can't slip up on you. That's what we we're just about to say. The word face signifies discernment or understanding. It, it means simply this, that the bride discerns and understands the wiles of the devil. <laughs> exactly. And that's what Paul, he said, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Amen. And that's the reason he said not to allow any roots of bitterness to spring up, he said. Don't allow any roots of bitterness to spring up, Paul said, because you open yourselves then, you open yourselves to, you, you let down the bar. And he said, we're not ignorant of his devices. And so this means the bride, when it says her nose or her face is like the Tower of Lebanon, which looking toward Damascus, the older enemy, that she is aware and understands and discerns what the devil is trying to do. <laughs> Amen. And keeps it in sight so that he can't pull it on there. Now you put all these together. You <laughs> and, he, and they go ahead to say, now th this is the church outside the bride. These are the daughters of Jerusalem saying all this. This is the testimony this church is leaving to, this bride is leaving to those outside the bride who are in the church world, though, not outside, but in the church world. And they see this in this bride. And, he, and then verse by thine head upon thee. Now here is a, they should change this because of course your head is upon you. But the word head here should be crown. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word, thy crown upon thee is like caramel. That is the crown. And caramel, do you know what the word caramel actually means? It literally means a mountain garden. A mountain garden. And it signifies fruitfulness. Fruitfulness in high places. You know, the feet like hinds feet. That's in Habakkuk. The Lord makes me to walk upon my high places. And it's the fruitfulness of the, of the joy of this experience. And the Bible, I think, one time speaks, doesn't it, of the, the crown of joy. I'm sure it does. It's one of the seven crowns, I believe, mentioned in the New Testament. Is the crown of, there are seven crowns, and I taught on them one time in the WMC. But one is the crown of joy, or rejoicing, maybe. The crown of rejoicing, maybe it is. Well, this is what I have in mind here, that she has on her the crown of rejoicing. Glory to God. Thy head is like caramel, and the hair of thy head like purple. Now, it doesn't mean she had purple hair. But purple, you know what it is? Wrong. Yes, ma'am, it's the mixture of red and blue. Red and blue. Sacrifice in heaven. Uh, and you know, that's, that was the colors in the temple. 
That was the colors of the tabernacle. On the, the hanging veil, that was the colors. It was always red and purple and blue. And blue and red together makes the purple. It's the royalty. Glory to God. And uh, she has the fruitfulness, the crown of joy. The crown of joy. And she has the royalty, thank God, of redemption. And it said the king is held in the galleries. This is absolutely one of the most stupid mistranslations, I guess, in the whole Bible. In the galleries. The word is tresses. And if you've got a new King James, it has tresses. It means long locks of hair. Now, and here is the literal meaning. They wound up their description of the bride. The king is held in the tresses, the locks of hair. Now, what does that mean? The locks of hair on the woman, you know, is supposed to signify their yieldedness to their authority, to the leadership. And so it means simply by this that this bride is so yielded to the authority of the bridegroom, so yielded to his headship, until it act it obligates him and binds him because of her yielding this to him. Now you take like <clears throat> in a, a husband and wife. If the wife submits herself to the husband, that puts a divine obligation on him. He's got to be the head of his house, and he's got to make the living, and he's got to support, and he's got to supply, and he's got to love her. And in the same way, if when the bride, <laughs> did you know when you submit yourself to Jesus completely, it obligates him to be the head of the <laughs> It obligates him to support you. And that's what it means. He's held. He's obligated. And it literally says this. What he literally says here, and what we say in everyday English, your long hair of complete submission to his authority obligates him to take care of you. Glory to God. He's obligated. He's <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, that, that, there's a great thought right there. The king is held in the tresses. Now, this is a description that the church outside, and you just reiterate those understanding what they mean. They tell about it here. She spreads the good news. She, she, as a member of the body, works together with all the other members just as a perfectly jeweled instrument. She has the, the Word of God in her life, so in her life, the Word of God in her life makes her life an epistle to others that they can learn to see the Word of God in action in her life. She has the breastplates of faith and love, and uh, she has a dignity of righteousness. She has an inner stillness. She has a discernment of the wiles and the intents of the enemy. She has a crown of joyfulness, the joy of the Lord. She has the royalty of the divine royalty of being a son of the king, a daughter of the king. Call her the prince's daughter. And she has given herself so in submission to the bridegroom until he is obligated to take care of her. Now there's your picture, stripping it of its metaphor, stripping it of its type. There's the picture in every danger. And does it make a beautiful picture? And as I said, every one of these types, we're not guessing. In fact, every one of them I showed you the New Testament counterpoint where they even use the same words, the same phrase. And, uh, and, and, and these types are carried through the Word of God. So this is not just daydreaming. It's not just... Uh, <coughs> Uh, something through the mouth or to say. It's actually type for the carrier through the whole Word of God. In fact, when we finish the Song of Solomon, I feel it on my heart for a few Tuesdays at least to take some of these types and take them all through the Word of God, carefully, like, like the pomegranate or some of these, where we said that means the individual believer. Just take it through and show you. Now, then the bridegroom speaks. He speaks up again. <laughs> After they've said all that, then the bridegroom himself speaks up. And in verse 6, and he said, how fair and how pleasant. And these are just what we would think they mean. How fair and how pleasant, as you say that to any other young lady, art thou, O love, for delights. For delights. And this word delights is, uh, is the same in Hebrew as the delicacies are luxuries. And the thought behind this is the bridegroom then speaks up on the heels of what the daughters of the Reuben have said. And he is simply saying, it's true what you said about her. It's true. 
and she is delightful to me. It's my association with her it is a luxury. It's a luxury. Glory to God. You know, if you can think about that in the hands that the Lord himself considers that we think about how wonderful is our association with the Lord. But he in turn considers his association with the bride as a luxury. Glory to God. As a luxury. <laughs> Thank God. How pleasant for delights, for delicacy. Thank God. There's nothing more great to the Lord than a person who's living the kind of a life and has the experience that they described in this, in this young lady. And then he went ahead to say, and he's talking this by stature. And it's not just talking about how tall you are. You're 5'3 or 5'4 something. Stature in the Bible means you're living. You're, you're living. How you live. Like Jesus said, and I, I, I remember, I, I mentioned this one time. <clears throat> Jesus said, who by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? And I always thought, you know, your stature today, we use the word, well, I'm six feet two. Now, now I got thinking one day, well, a cubit is 18 inches. Now, who would want to add 18 inches on the six feet two? <laughs> well, that's a stupid thing. Who by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? Who'd want to add 18 inches to your height in the first place? So I went running to the to see what the word meant. And the word means the length of life, your life. And what he means, suppose you suppose the day you took your first step, one of the it's pedometers that measure how far you walk. Suppose the day you took your first step, Sister Fox, as a baby, they had fashioned a pedometer on you that had measured every mile you'd walked. How many miles do you suppose you'd have walked by now? It would, have been, it would be amazing how many thousands and thousands and thousands of miles we have walked. But he said, yeah, but just in the daily housewife, or keeping a house, housekeeper. But he said what Jesus said, there's no way if you had walked 10,000 miles through 60 years of living, you couldn't add 18 inches to that when it gets time for God to take you to And you know what 18 inches is? That's only one half of a, of a grown man's footstep. They say that a, a grown man walking at a normal rate steps about three feet every time. Just about the other. Well, 18 inches be half of that. And he said, and what Jesus literally said... You may have walked, you may have walked twenty thousand miles, Sister Ricky, and since you walked, took your first step as a baby, but not oh, one yeah. thing you could do to add half of a man's footstep to your life when God gets rid of you. Now that's what Jesus was saying. That's what the word stature means here. Your stature, your your life that you're living, your life that you're living <laughs> is like to a palm tree. Now there is one of the great symbols uh, are are types in the Bible of the Christian is the palm tree. The palm tree is the all-sufficient tree. You got a palm tree, it will furnish you drink and food and clothing and housing. I mean, they literally get that from the palm tree. <laughs> it's, it's everything. And thy statues like to the palm tree. That would be a good one one day to... Uh, uh, use. But here is an interesting thing that I think is probably the principal meaning right here. Your stature, that is the way you live, your daily life, is like a palm tree. Well, now what is the principal uh, thing about a palm tree? I've been in, that, in those countries over there. And you're going across that desert country and even looking out of an airplane, you're 9,000 feet in the air and there's sand, just sand. And I've flown over numbers of deserts. And you look over there and you see a dark clump way over there. And you know what? You know that dark clump is an oasis of palm trees. And it means that if you can get over there, there's water and shade and fresh. Brother Samuel, I looked that up one day and it's 360 uses of a palm tree. For a palm tree, I think. It's a, it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous tree. And I think where it said, Thy stature is like to a palm tree, to me, it speaks to me that just like a palm tree in the desert shows a wayfarer, over there is water, over there is rest, over there is refreshment, over there is shade from the sun. 
that the bride, by the way she lives and the testimony she lives, points the people to a life of refreshment, a life of, of, uh, of thirst being quenched, a life of hidden from the sun. And you know what I mean? That our lives, the way we live and the victory that we have, should point the world where the oasis is. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. That's where it is. Glory to God. That's thy statues like to a palm tree, and thy breast to clusters of grapes. And of course, the breast signifies <laughs> nurture, nurture. And grapes, of course, signify wine and the spiritual life. And this, and and he's simply saying here that the bride is able to nurture with spiritual life people who need help, people who need God. Amen. People should be able to come to us and find spiritual nurture to us. Hallelujah. And that is a tremendous one. One of the Hebrew names for God was El Shaddai. And El Shaddai you find it so many times <laughs> and that shad is the word for breast. That's the word translated breast right here. I'm going to see what how that's translated in our King James Bible. The Shaddai part is translated uh, Almighty God. Anywhere in the Bible you read that word Almighty God, it's translated, it means the great nourisher. And in Psalm 91, doesn't it use that Almighty? He that are well, I, I can't quote it right now. Psalm 91. Who that dwelleth in the circuit place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that word Almighty is translated from El Shaddai, which means the, the breasted one, the, the life giver, the nourisher. That's literally what it means. And she's a nourisher of spiritual life. Thy breast of clusters of grapes, signifying the spirit, a nourisher of spiritual life. <laughs> and then now this is the bridegroom speaking. I said, I will go up to the palm tree. <laughs> the bridegroom himself is saying, I will go to the palm tree. I will take hold of its boughs. Thank God. Now also thy breast shall be like clusters of the vine. And the fragrance of thy breath like apples. Now, here's a very interesting theme. The, bride himself, the bridegroom himself said, I'm, I'm going to this vine tree. I, in, in communion and in acquaintance and friendship and conversation, I'm going to this palm tree because she gives forth spiritual life to people. And, but he said, and the, and the, and the fragrance of thy breath now, what did it say in that the smell of thy nose? <laughs> That's an unusual way to translate that. It meant the fragrance of thy breath. He literally said, your breath smells like apples. Now, apples is a type of the love of God. We saw that in chapter 2 and verse 3. Chapter 2 and verse 3. And uh, where he said, as the apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. I sat down under his shadow with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Glory to God. And the apple has always been the love fruit. Did you know that? All through all through centuries. I guess ever, ever since man has known apples grew on trees, apples signified love. That's the love fruit. <laughs> and uh, and what he said, thy breath like apples. You know, if you smoke, your breath smells like tobacco. If you eat onions, your breath smells like onions. And what he's saying, and literally what he's saying here is her experience here, her experience, her stature like a palm tree, has so much of the love of God in her life that she literally, the love of God is given forth from her. Just like people smell nicotine on you if you smoke them back. And they can smell dark if you take them dark. <laughs> now take them literally, you're, you will emanate, your very experience emanates the love of God. Now brother, I mean sister, this is the one Thing we need today in the world. I tell you, we need this more than anything else. An emanation of the love of God. And the bridegroom himself now is saying this. 
And look how all of these then fit together, how they just fit together perfectly. He is saying that, that your life, your, the way you live is, is like a palm tree. It, it, it shows the way to spiritual rest and, and, and the thirst quenching. And uh, then he said, there's a very fragrance of the love of God in your life. And of course, that's the thing that would win people to the Lord. That would be the thing that would, they could see the love of God in your life. That would be the thing that would point them. And he concludes what he says here, and the roof of thy mouth, like the best wine. And now the roof of the mouth, or the mouth, and, and, and uh, of course, typifies conversation, the way you speak. And he says it's like the best wine. In other words, the conversation is the conversation about the Lord. It's about spiritual things. The bride, the, her very conversation should be a conversation of spiritual things. And of course, all this, you see, it's 6, 7, and 8, these verses fit together then. It's her very life. It's the very essence of her life. The very essence of her very living. There's such a spiritual dignity to her living like the palm tree. And there's such a love of God emanating from her. And her very conversation is talking to Jesus. This all appeals to people to draw them to the Lord. Isn't that right? This all, is, this makes her a palm tree. Pulling people, showing people where God is, where the oasis is. Thank God. See, they fit. Thank God. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I'm going to take about two more verses. I'm going to stop for this morning. And uh, then the bride interrupts right here in the middle of a verse. The bridegroom, it's been speaking, then the bride interrupts and says, For my beloved. Now, it, it was the bridegroom who said of the bride that the roof of my mouth like the best wine. But then it's the bride who says of the bridegroom, For my beloved that goeth down sweetly, or that goeth sweetly. You see, down was supplied by the translators causing the lips of those who are asleep to speak. Now, what we know here that goeth down, they supplied the word down because it was uh, understood in the Hebrew, and they're speaking here of new sweet wine. <laughs> new sweet wine. Speaking of it going down sweetly. Now, in the Hebrew, the word sweetly indicated in its meaning they were speaking of new sweet wine. Well, what is new wine? We know what new It's the spiritual life. It's the life in the spirit. New wine. And it causes the lips of those who are asleep to speak. You know, he caught the bride herself asleep one time, didn't he? He caught her in bed. And, uh, and so she interrupts. He had just said that the roof of her mouth was like the best wine. So she interrupts and says, well, he's like the wine. <laughs> He's like one. He is the one. He's where the wine came from. He is the source of the new wine. He said the Spirit. And even those who sleep, like she one time did, it will cause them to be aroused. Cause them to be aroused from their sleep. Like he aroused her when he came and knocked on her door and tried to get her to get up. Amen. And then she, and then she continues with this, I am my beloved. And his desire is toward me. Desire or longing. <laughs> Glory to God. And he had just said that back up in verse 8. He said, I will go up to the palm tree. So she reiterates down here, his desire is toward me. Amen. And do you know that up in heaven now, sitting at the right hand of God, Christ is not praying for sinners anymore. He completed his work and when he died on the cross, when he said, it is in that, or it is finished, you notice he never did minister to sinners anymore. And if you'll notice, in the last chapter 2 of all the Gospels, I pointed this out, from the time that Jesus rose from the dead, he never went anymore ministered to the unsaved world. And uh, he, he went to be with the Father, and from where he makes intercession for the saints. From the time that he said on the cross, when he said, it is finished, he meant as far as a sinner's concern, he had finished his work. That's all he could do. That's it's our he job. That's our job. That's what they? That's our job. Now, that's right. That's our job to minister. And he now ministers to us. 
He now prays for us. He makes intercession for the saints. You have no place in the Bible anywhere, even going through the Revelation, that after Jesus was raised from the dead that he ever did minister anymore to the unsaved. He, plays it, he puts that job on the church. That becomes our responsibility. And that's why he's talking about all these beautiful things about the bride here. Did you notice how much of what was said about the bride this morning has to do with her ministry to others? And you remember what I said, this whole scene that we're in now has to do with the bride's ministry on the earth. It started out, Thou art beautiful, O my love, as tears of. That was back in chapter 6 and verse 4. And clear through this whole scene, it, it pictures the bride on earth, and the predominant thing you keep seeing verse after verse after verse are the attributes that make her a blessing to other people in the world. And that's the whole thing. Everything that we said this morning, everything that the daughter of Jerusalem said about her, everything that the bridegroom says about her are attributes that make her a testimony and a blessing and a source of life for the world. And that's what we're, then we're going to stop right there because then in verse 11 we pick up this ministry and, and we'll continue with that next time. So, you know, what would be beautiful, and I, I thought about doing this sometime, I, I thought about sometimes just uh, typing out the book of the Song of Solomon. It wouldn't take us, it's just eight verses, eight chapters. Typing it up, but instead of saying pomegranate and, and the breast and nose and all this, uh, write it out in the exact meaning that it would be in this time. Would that be a beautiful thing? It would be a brother. Mm -hmm. I've never known anybody to do that. I don't know why somebody hasn't thought of that now. I've got that the other day. Go ahead. Just retype it, see, and, and, and take, and instead of using the type, use what they actually mean. Put those words all in there and write it out like that. And it would be so beautifully understood then, and it would make such a beautiful thing. But, you know, I was thinking this morning, let me just be an ideal thing. <laughs> <laughs> why can't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> the last time really? he called on me, I kept going, and she'll be on the wood five until she can have it. I know. Yeah. They said to me, like, I believe that uh, you have to be filled with the Spirit to go into rapture. But somebody said, well, if you do, why did the Bible just come plain out and say it? Well, to me, Romans 8, 11 does. But uh, they said, well, why did it just come plain out and say some of these things? Why is it like in salvation? It'll say one place you've got to believe to be saved, another place you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved, another place you make confession. And so why did it just simply what it takes to be saved? Why just put it all down in one? And I said, I believe the Bible is written that way for one reason. If the Bible explicitly and plainly laid everything out, then it could be understood by human brains alone without any help from the Spirit. That's right. It would become nothing but a philosophy. But the Bible being written in mysteries like it is, you have to have the Spirit to understand it, and I think that's what God wanted all the time, that you have to understand it in the Spirit. I don't believe it's written out plainly like a geography for that very reason that human minds... You wouldn't need the Spirit. You just read it, and that's what it says. Okay. No Spirit had to be involved. But then that would be a thing. That Spirit says, the Spirit says the things. That's right. The deep things of God. And, the, and I think the Bible is written like that, so you have to have the Spirit to find it out. Amen. Well, glory. God never intended that the human brain understand the Word of God. <laughs>